Here we go, going live. Hello, everyone. Hello, Craig. Hello, Rob and Deb. Hello, Cotty and John. Paul and Roz, good to see you. Peter and Karen and Kevin and Emily almost here. Hi. How lovely to see you all. Well, yes, I am jet lagged and uh, I have to say about an hour ago, I didn't know if I was going to make it, but we took the dogs for a walk in the sunshine. It's such a beautiful afternoon here and it perked me right up. So hopefully I'll be able to perk, perk indeed, Jill. Welcome got, back. Hey. hey, welcome back. Nice to be back. I will keep drinking my water, Craig. I think um, I think staying hydrated after a big flight is very important and I'll try and keep my eyes open as well because I keep looking at myself and I, when I get tired, my eyes get very slitty. <laughs> ah, well, all of a sudden we're at the end of our latest box, box five. It's a bit sad, isn't it? We haven't got ourselves organised with box six yet. So I have some ideas for the next couple of weeks to kind of um, give ourselves time to get that box six organised and made up and sent out. So hello, Rod and Sharpie. Lovely to see you. Um, so last time we were all talking, I was in Tuscany drinking lots of Chianti and a little bit of Robinson Chardonnay. Um, this week, sorry, a itchy eye. This week we have the 2021 Magic Stalks Shiraz. Woohoo! Unfortunately, um, I don't think Jeremy's going to be able to join us tonight because he's got other commitments. And this is his this is his project. So hopefully I'll be able to say some sensible things about it. The first thing I noticed actually looking at it is that it's 12.5%, which is quite low for Shiraz. And that's got something to do with the style that we're trying to make here. So a slightly earlier pick, slightly lighter, crunchier, more red-fruited Shiraz, not sort of the heavy, rich, um, full-bodied, savoury, whole bunch character that we see in our regular McIntyre Shiraz. You'll also notice, and, and those of you who've been with me from the beginning will remember that the first one of these, which was I think the 2019 um we made our own little label because we didn't know we didn't know how we were going to label it and we made our own label by writing down all the things we'd done to the grapes to make them into wine and I wrote it out in my neatest handwriting which was still slightly illegible and so we've borrowed that from oh shell oh no in Tassie good work I yes I'm very sorry um I'm very sorry that I didn't get an email out on Monday um, for you guys, I was just uh, racing around at the tail end of my trip and completely forgot until I got on the plane and I went, oh, well, I'm on the plane now, so I can't do anything till I get to the other end. So apologies for not sending an email on Monday or Tuesday. Um, I almost expected nobody to be here tonight because I didn't send out an email till now. So um, anyway, uh, it sounds like, Shell, you have done all right. A Paxton Shiraz, scallop pie, cauliflower pie from Bakery Simple Salad. How delightful. Um, we, so, um, so if you read the notes here, that'll tell you what we did to the wine, but we'll go through it as well. But let me get some in a glass. Craig is saying a lot more reserved than the previous vintage, and I think that that had something to do with 2021 as a vintage, but also um, some decisions that were made about picking it. So let me get this open. Did anyone decant it? Did you feel it needed decanting? If Craig's saying it's reserved, then maybe it does. Let's have a little look. Mm. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't think that needs. I don't think that needs decanting. I think it'll open up quite nicely in the glass. There we go. I have a feeling I might have. Uh, Richard the magpie coming to steal it. Could you bring the bottle back once you've poured some because I might need to refer to the label. Uh, oh, Craig, I did not suffer the curse of internet on the plane until I got to Sydney and there was internet on the plane from Sydney to Melbourne, but I just ignored it. 
because it was very early in the morning. Hello, Penny. Lovely to see you. Um, uh, okay, Robin Deb uh, decanted. Funny, immediately lovely. So yeah, if you did want to, um, if you did want to stick in the decanter, what I might do is because I haven't tasted it yet. You can do this if you put it in your glass and you can't really. Um, can't really smell it. Look how much better I can smell that. You can get lots of air into a glass of wine in a decanter. And then back into the glass. It means you've got to wash a decanter later, but, you know, that's all right. Ah, that's better. Yeah, it's much better with a decanter. So if you do have a decanter, chuck it in a decanter and then... Um, Keep going. Uh, yes, I agree, Craig. I don't believe in working on a plane. I did do a little bit of work at the airport. Hello, Alice and Andrew. Lovely to see you. Hello, Nina. Ciao, ciao. Um, oh, you use the aerator. Hmm. Um, yes, work on a plane is evil. Well, it's not evil. It's actually, I just, I, I don't know. I, my brain doesn't compute on a plane. I sometimes have some nice ideas that I write down in a notebook to deal with later. But as soon as I get on the plane, my brain kind of goes, and I have to just watch movies and sleep, and um, that's okay too. Okay, so we have – oh, Emily's here now. Oh, hello, Emily. After a long lunch. Mm. <laughs> just in time for a little glass of Shiraz. Perfect. So so this Shiraz, I think – oh, hello, Noreen. How are you? Um, and all the family as well. Hello, Zach and Jack. Good to see you. Oh, everyone's popping in. Thank you. Um, so the first thing that I noticed when I poured it is that it's got a lovely colour, but it's not nearly as deep as the colour of the um, of the McIntyre Shiraz. It looks at if you don't have, like if you just have me behind it, not light behind it, it looks quite dense. But as soon as you get some light behind it, then you can see it's, I can't show it to you, but I can see that it, it's not nearly as opaque as the as the other. Um, the decant for me just got just opened it up a little bit and got rid of a slight um, capsicum note that uh, that I don't mind, but I prefer it when it blows off. And it's immediately more interesting. Hello, Sue and Daryl, both with COVID. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you two are feeling okay. Have you still got your sense of smell and taste? Um, <laughs> Thank you, Nina. It does match my specs, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, so what am I smelling? It's really interesting. It's uh, it, I think it is, for me, it's, I, I, I haven't had the 2020 for a little while, but this to me is really appealing because of that sort of crunchy, crunchy sort of red plum fruit character. It's also got a tiny little bit of black pepper. It doesn't have a huge amount of carbonic maceration character. There's a little bit there, but it's very subtle. Um, but it just, it smells really fresh and bright and vibrant. Um, let's have a look. Again, on the palate, red plums and that slightly kind of bitter, sour um, note that you get from plum skins and sucking on the pip, um, which I really like. That's the, those sort of those quite strong tannins. So let's remind ourselves how this wine was made because this is, as I said, this is Jeremy's project. This is Shiraz fruit that comes from the Osborne Vineyard um, that Richard and Jeremy were going to graft over to Pinot Noir but didn't get round to and then thought, well, why don't we try making Shiraz from the Shiraz vines instead? So on the 22nd of March 20, 2021, this fruit was picked and it went into giant bags and covered up covered up with CO2 and the bags were sealed. Um, how many days later? March has 30, 30 days, 31 days. So that would be uh, 9, 10, 11 days later on the 2nd of April. Uh, we walked on top over three days. So basically um, up until walking on top of those grapes, they were a uh, whole bunch and 
basically uh, intact berries. So you, that's when you're getting your carbonic maceration for those sort of 11, 12 days. Once we've given it a chance to do that, uh, we then get in there with our feet to crush the to crush the fruit a little bit and to get the juice out of the grapes. And we then, after three days of walking on it, and that's a little bit of a change from the previous one. I think with more more foot stomping over a longer period, and then it was transferred to a vat and sealed with CO two. Um, by that, by the six, which is four days later, the wine will be actively fermenting um, with wild yeasts on the stalks. But at that stage, we decided to destem early on in the ferment, and that the whole point about that is that you. We're trying to concentrate more on the carbonic maceration characters and less on the stalk tannin extraction. Um, so by destemming it early in the fermentation, uh, we're taking the stalks away, so we're having uh, less influence of talk st- stalk tannins. Here we go, my first, my first jet laggy um, mix up. Stalk tannins are not having the chance to soak into the wine as much um, then on the ninth we basket pressed it set, sent it to Berwick um, and bottled it six months later so the idea about that is to keep it fresh and bright and crunchy um, Rob and Deb are getting a little uh, a little saltiness which I think um, is uh, I agree I think there is a little bit of that for me it's like a salted plum kind of character like the, those Japanese um, salted plums that have that sort of red plum tanginess but the salt as well which makes it into more of a sort of a pickle almost but um quite interesting mm. Alison's enjoying the pruny characters on the nose Craig I think maybe you maybe the aeration could have um opened it up a bit faster than ideal, but it's um, it, it it is a it is a sort of a slightly lighter, more red fruited wine than the two thousand was. Um, yes, Penny Umaboshi Plum. Thank you very much. I never know the never know the um, <laughs> the right name for it. Um, yeah, it's it's different from all of our other Shirazes. It's different from the previous. Uh, um, Magic Stalk Shiraz, and it's certainly different from the McIntyre Shiraz, which is picked at a later date, more richness, dark fruit, roundness, which might be what you're kind of looking for, Craig. Um, it is a lighter, fresher, crisper style of wine, and it's a style that's become really popular in cool climates like the Mornington Peninsula, Yarra Valley, Tasmania, um, even uh, the Adelaide Hills and um, Steve Pinnell has a play with it in McLaren Vale. Um, by picking Shiraz a little bit earlier than at what's been seen in Australia generally is optimum ripeness. You get less dark fruit, more red fruit, but you get a sort of crunchy, savoury, lighter kind of character to it. So um, not surprised if you're struggling with it a little bit, Craig, what are you what are you eating with it? What food have you matched to it tonight? Because I didn't give you any guidance on that, I'm afraid. Um, it's also um, I want to say attenuated, but that's not quite the right word. There's a character to the nose. It's quite delicate, but it goes. It sort of stretched out. This kind of long. Um, elegant sort of um, aroma profile on the nose it's not big and rich straight away so it is a little bit it's a little subtle it takes a little while to to come on and the tannins are quite intense um, so it, it it doesn't have the flesh that a lot of the um, other shirazes that we've made have but it's it absolutely has those tannins I think this would be a great wine with um uh, we talked about this actually with the 2020. I'm just remembering, it would be fantastic with sort of really good sausage rolls or patty pies, um, those kind of flavours, because uh, it's got that kind of um, sweet, savoury, salty note that you get in um, 
tomato sauce. So <laughs> there's that sweetness, but it's not too sweet. It's got a tanginess, it's got a savouriness, and it's got that little salty kind of note to it, um, but still a little bit of sweetness. So it's real. It's that real kind of um, Asian balance thing that we talk about. Um, I think it would be great with spag bowl, Nina, absolutely. Oh, Craig, taking public transport to work destroyed your smell. Well, I was a bit worried that I was losing my sense of smell um, before I had a before I had a shower coming off the plane. And I think it's fine now. I think I was just um, I think my nose was protecting itself from um, the smell of Kate having been on a plane for thirty hours. Um, Kevin with Mexican, I think it could work really well as well because it could cope because it's not a big heavy um, super tannic Shiraz. It, it could work with a little bit of spice. Uh, not too much, I don't think, but, you know, it depends how things work. A glass of sparkling water has helped, Craig. I, well, you were the one who told me to keep drinking water, so I think that's always good to take one's own advice at these times. Um, Cotty made sausage rolls, having them with homemade tomato relish and cucumber pickles. Sounds perfect. So, yes, I think this is... This is again a um, sausage roll or a or a chipolata or you know, something with a bit of fat, a bit of a, a bit of salty, meaty goodness. Um, ah, Rob, how interesting! Rob's just said strange in relation. Just then, when you said that was stretched out aroma, I took a long, gentle whiff rather than my usual hard sniff. It was a very different experience. Never noticed that before. So, yes, the way you smell wine, the way you kind of approach wine, as well as the way you put wine in your mouth to taste it will actually affect the way you taste it. So let's do that with this wine because I think that would be really interesting. So if you're – most people when they go to smell something will kind of give it a good swirl and then stick their nose in and have a good – so give that a go. Now, that I find – you don't get maybe as much from the nose as you would if you took a slightly gentler, longer smell of the wine, which is what I've sort of learnt to do. So um, what I would do is more like this. So I'm breathing in slowly and letting the aromas kind of roll across my nasal cavity. Uh, my retronasal cavity, and that kind of gives the gives the aromas time to sort of catch up on themselves, if that makes sense. Um, it is quite a different way to smell wine, and it's it it works even better if you keep your mouth a little bit open, which I think I've said to you before. So you stick your nose in the glass, you keep your mouth outside the glass, keep your mouth a little bit open, and then take a long, slow sniff in. And you get all that sort of plum. It becomes red plum, dark plum, umeboshi, salted plum, um, that slightly sort of tomato saucy kind of spicy, tomato-y, tangy, salty kind of character, which I think is really interesting. The other thing you can do to, to change the way you taste wine, and this is something that someone showed me uh, a number of years ago, which I think is really fascinating. Often when I'm tasting wine, I don't want to drink too much of it at a time. So... I'll just put a tiny little bit in my mouth and then I'll swirl it around and taste it. So do that first. Just have a tiny sip. And you kind of roll it around your mouth, give it a little bit of a slurp. Um, and you'll taste lots of things. It'll taste, it tastes quite tangy. There's quite an acid kind of zing to it when you taste it like that. Now, same wine, but take a good mouthful. Not like don't fill up your mouth completely, but take a good sip rather than just a little tiny dribble like this. I'm still rolling it around my mouth. And swallowing a little bit and keeping the rest of my mouth moving it around you get much more intensity from the wine like that it's not a great way to drink wine because you drink it too fast if you're taking big mouthfuls and when I, when I say a big mouthful 
I probably had about half as much wine as would fit in my mouth comfortably in my mouth then for that one. And not only do you taste the um, the fruit better when you have that extra wine in your mouth, you can get uh, more of the tannin texture. I still swirled it around. I still slurped a little bit to get some air through it. But it's because it's a larger mass of the wine, you get a better impression of its flavour profile. So somebody taught me that a long time ago. And instead of just taking lots of little sips, in the same way that if you smell the wine a number of times, then it, it can, your, palate, your nose will get tired. Um, if you take lots of little sips, then your palate gets fatigued and you can't taste as well. Cotty's mouth's tingling after doing that. Yeah, mine too. So because you've got all that all that tannin and acid that's kind of run around the mouth. Um, and it, it does make the wine taste completely different. A little almond taste, Nina. I agree. It's almost like a smoked almond or a, or a roasted salted smoked almond. It's, um, it's really rather, it's rather lovely and savoury. And as it sits in the glass, I'm getting a little bit more of that carbonic um, perfumed lift coming out of the wine as well as having some... Um, Sorry, the dog's doing, Frodo was making strange noises, but I think he was just getting comfy in the sun. It's got, as well as that sort of slight kind of rose water kind of aromatic, it's also, which reminds me of Turkish Delight, it's got this, um, it's got this smell that's a little bit like bubble gum. It's a little bit like those raspberry tubes <clears throat> or even the raspberry and cream tubes. And so you're getting those kind of lifted, slightly confected aromatics, even though the wine is really savoury. Mm. Penny, I think Moroccan lamb with Kumara could work very nicely with Shiraz, particularly this Shiraz because it would cope with those Moroccan spices. Uh, Craig has said controversially that he thinks the wine tastes different if you drink it rather than spitting it. Uh, I sort of agree, Craig. I think um, with wine tasting, it's always recommended that you spit the wine out because wine has got more alcohol than beer. But also I think um, often I will let just a tiny little bit kind of slip down the back of my throat to see how it travels across the back of the tongue before spitting the rest out if I'm spitting um, because I agree, I think that you do get something extra from feeling the wine in the back of your throat and the and the post swallowing kind of taste left in your mouth is different from spinning. Um, so yeah, absolutely. If you've ever done any beer tasting, for example, you actually don't spit. You you have to swallow it because of the bubbles and because of the hoppiness, which is a bit retro nasal. Um, so beer tasting is quite hard work uh, to stay um, focused enough when you're having to swallow the beer along the way. Um, so I think when I'm trying to judge wine, which I try to do less and less these days, I think spitting it out is a really good idea because it does give you it does give you um, more versatility to taste more wines. But I do think that a wine does taste different if you drink it. And Alison and Andrew have said the brain will deal with it differently. And I think it does because almost immediately you get some alcohol in your system. It just relaxes the brain, flicks that little relax switch. And um, it, it means that you're more um, predispossessed to, um, to enjoy the wine rather than be critical of the wine if you're, if you're swallowing it because that little the alcohol gets in there. Um, the brain is really weird though because when I'm tasting wine and not swallowing, my brain thinks that I'm drinking wine and it processes the liquid in my body faster than it usually would. And so that's one of the reasons that I always encourage people to drink lots of water. It's not actually the water that's making you have to visit the bathroom slightly more regularly after a big drinking session. It's um, it's the way the wine and the alcohol and the fact even if you're spitting the wine out, your brain thinks that it's drinking um, liquid and so therefore it produces produces wee more quickly, which is quite 
quite weird. Um, enough talk of we. Let's talk about wine. So this could also be a really good pizza wine. What was the favourite wine from my trip? Or oh, is that a conversation for next week? Let's save that for next week, Craig, because I thought um, I thought next week I had a couple of ideas. I've got a couple of ideas of breaking the seal, absolutely, Shell. Um, but it's more than that. It's, it, it's, it's just a weird sensation. It's a weird thing. But I, I've often got very dehydrated doing wine tasting when I'm not actually um, swallowing wine because my body thinks that I am and is expelling more liquid than I'm putting into it. Um, I thought next week and the week after, because we, as I said, we haven't done we haven't done um, the plan for box six, and we'd like we'd quite like box six to get us up to Christmas. Um, so I reckon that over the next couple of weeks, I think we should have a session on Chardonnay, like we had our Pinot Noir session. Um, a few weeks ago uh, at the end of the last box, I think it was, where everyone brings their favourite Chardonnay to the tasting and we talk generally about Chardonnay as a great variety and you guys can tell me about how your Chardonnay that you're drinking is looking. So I think that would be fun for next week. But I also thought it might be quite fun to do a little a little Chianti um, tasting. So I know I was um, I was in Chianti tasting Robinson Chardonnay, but I will do a little bit of research and see um, which Chiantis that I know and like are easily accessible, um, easily accessible to um, as many of you as possible. And we might leave that for the week after next because it'll give you a little bit more time to access the wine. Um, and then we'll do a little we'll do a little county tasting of um, maybe one or two uh, one or two or three counties depending on how excited I get about it. Um, Craig, our second favorite Chardonnay, of course. <laughs> That's right. And the next box will definitely have a bit of a Chardonnay focus because we have a new vintage of a state Chardonnay, and we have the two single vineyard Chardonnays to release um, to you guys. So. Uh, so I think having a general talk about Chardonnay next week um, could be a really good sort of entree into the next box as well. So does that sound okay if we do Chardonnay next week and Chianti uh, the following week? And I, and I will I will give you plenty of notice about um, some Chianti's that I might be talking about, things that I recommend that you might want to grab hold of um, from your local uh, wine store. And uh, and we'll also I'll also send you out a few um, recipe ideas for uh, foods to go with the Chianti, um, both something quite simple and then a couple of things that might be a little bit more elaborate. Because I've got to say the food over there is uh, is as magnificent as it's always been. Um, I think I'll be on uh, bread on uh, bread crusts and water for a couple of weeks after my time away I'm feeling I'm feeling quite replete <laughs> from from all the eating and drinking and carrying on uh Peter says pipe down Jill you're coughing too loudly and interrupting his <laughs> his enjoyment of my talking <laughs> oh dear so what did everyone do last week while I was while I was madly driving for, I'm so glad actually that I didn't try and do drinks with Kate last week I seriously thought about just doing something but in the end um with the day that I had I had to leave Manchester at 7 30 in the morning which means I would have been an hour into my drive from Manchester to London um and then I could have pulled us up pulled across at the petrol station or something I guess um and then I drove down to London uh picked up a few things and uh, an extra person and drove to Hook which is halfway to Bournemouth um where we did a dinner on Thursday night at Cavist. So um, beautiful friends of ours, um, the the team at Cavist, they've been supporting Muraduck for a long time, um, but that was pretty good. But, yeah, you guys did have quite a bit of rain last week, which has been a little bit scary and a little bit worrying. Um, how is Sydney for the rain last week? I know down here um, we certainly had some issues um, my cousins are up around Shepparton and they're supposed to be coming here for 
um, a family reunion this Saturday. So we're hoping that there's not a lot more rain before they uh, before they um, jump in their cars and come down because they didn't think they were going to. Ah, Shell, you guys worked last Thursday. I do need to come back and balance you. That's crazy. Craig went and did uh, Craig and and um, Karen did a Spanish degustation with wine matching. Oh, cool. Oh, all wines with Aussie and French. That's terrible. Um, <laughs> uh, I can report back that the water has subsided from across Daryl Road to the north of us, but if you are driving down to Muraduck from that direction at any time until the council actually come and fix it, the road's about half as wide as it usually is, so don't try and pass someone coming the other way. Um, because the edges of the road are also very, um, very crumbly and unstable. And uh, I think if your car slipped down the edge, then you probably would need a tow truck to come and get you out. Well, my dears, I think I'm fading a bit fast, but I don't feel like I've told you very much too much about this wine. I do think it's, um, let's have another look at it before I, before I call it a day. Um, I th do you think it's opening up? You went to Dessous. Is that a restaurant, Sharpie and Rod? Hey? I know. Call it a day. That's a that's an in joke here at Muraduck. We had a we had a um, an Argentinian who worked for us for a long time, and um, and instead of saying call it a day, he says I'll call it a day, and that's become part of my vernacular. There's more licorice coming out of the wine now that it's breathed up a little bit. Black licorice and red licorice. For me, the um, – so uh, between you guys and me, I think Jeremy was slightly disappointed this wine didn't show more carbonic maceration character. And I think it's coming up really nicely now. Oh, dear, we've got creatures in the roof now. It sounds like a cat's up there <laughs> stomping around. Um, Polly's not very happy about it. Um, see you later, Penny. We'll talk Italy really soon. Penny's got a plan for us for Italy, which I think could be quite exciting. Anyway, more on that later. Um, I think the carbonic, the lolly shop kind of aromatics are coming up in the wine as it is, but we did a little bit of um, different stuff to different stuff to the um, fruit in 2022. Um, to see if we could kind of accentuate that even a little bit more. So that'll be interesting to look at in about a year's time. Um, oh, the other thing I did mean to tell you is that we still have a tiny bit of the 2020 Magic Stalk Shiraz, but only a tiny bit. And Nigel's about to go on a um, on a push to sell it. So if you did want some, um, yeah, I know, Craig, I think that the Cab Mac is, um, is a bit subtle uh, particularly before the wines breathe up, but uh, just hang on in there, and the uh, 2022 will be, um, I think, a bit more obvious in those circumstances. Um, oh, excuse me, oh, it's getting me. Oh no! Ah. So a little bit of 2020 um, at the winery. If you want some, give us a hoy, send us an email, give Nigel a call tomorrow. Nigel's manning things uh, at the moment because Jeff's having a little bit of time off. Um, and I will go and get myself out of this jet lag. I will see you guys all again next week um, for a Chardonnay discussion and the following week for a Chianti discussion. And in the meantime, I will get box six sorted out and I will ask Jeff very nicely to put together a button for me. We'll send it out. And we will continue this conversation again another day. It's been awesome. Everyone. Hello, Jeff. Jeff's popped in. Hi, Jeff. Hope you're feeling well <laughs> and enjoying your time off. Um, it's been lovely, everyone. I will see you all next week. Great to be back. Lovely to see you. Um, and, yes, uh, Enjoy your magic stalks and we'll do Chardonnay next week. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.